So uh, we set the goal of this conference really is how do we transform our existing economy, create a new economy. And as Gerald Perovitz said, you know, we're tackling the biggest, most powerful institutions that have ever existed on our planet in this really complex system. So what I want to focus on today is how do you actually go about changing such extremely complex systems? And I'm not an expert on complex systems, but one of the leading experts was Danella Meadows, who uh, Richard Heinberg talked about, the Lucy Grove. She's been her whole life studying complex systems. And what she identified was these key leverage points, places you can intervene to have a maximum impact, maximum ability to change a complex system. So I want to talk about a few of the key leverage points she identified and how they might apply to the task we face right now. So the most powerful leverage point, the best place to intervene, she said was to change the paradigm. And this is kind of our understanding of what's possible. And I, I interpret it partly is our understanding of what's biophysically possible. So the current paradigm, and you know, and mostly I'll be focusing on economics here. The current paradigm, the economic paradigm, that's shared by socialist countries and capitalist countries and across the political spectrum is never-ending economic growth. So the idea is we want an economy that can continue to grow and grow and grow forever. This implies there are no biophysical limits whatsoever, that the economy is the whole thing. And the ecosystem, you know, it's a useful source of natural resources, a useful place to spew our waste, provides a few amenities here and there, but basically it's the never-ending economic growth that is the goal. And that, or that is, that is the, the vision that we can, the, I would just say that goal implies this vision of, uh, of an infinite planet or limitless resources. Um, we have to flip that paradigm around entirely. This is as profound a flip. You know, we used to believe that the uh, Earth, the sun circled the Earth. Now we view the Earth as circling the sun. And I believe the transformation we need to make in our paradigm of the economic system is equal. We have to recognize that the economic system is the part. It is sustained and contained by the global ecosystem. It's the whole. So we, have, we learn from the laws of physics. It's a law of physics. You can't make something from nothing. Everything the economic system produces, it really is a transformation of raw materials provided by nature into something of use to us. You also can't do work without energy, as Richard Heinberg pointed out. We need, the major source of energy today is fossil fuels, almost 90% of our energy. So all this economic work we do, all this economic activity uses these fossil fuels to transform those raw materials. Another law of physics, you can't make nothing from something. <coughs> when we burn those fossil fuels, they don't disappear. They become waste, greenhouse gases, particulate matter. When we transform those materials from nature to economic products, everything eventually breaks down, wears out, falls apart, returns to the ecosystem as waste. Everything here in this room will eventually, all our clothing, goes back to the ecosystem as waste. So there's clearly just biophysical limits there. There's a finite limit to how much the, eco the, the economic system can grow. But more pressing than these physical limits, we have to look at the laws of ecology. Those raw materials we transform into economic products alternatively serve as the structural building blocks of ecosystems. So in a particular configuration, those structural building blocks create these ecosystems that purify our air, uh, purify our water, stabilize our climate, protect us from UV radiation, uh, sustain the productive capacity of our agriculture, of our ecosystems. Um, absolutely essential. When we remove those building blocks and spew back waste, we degrade those ecosystems. We lose those services that are essential to our welfare. And some people have said that this idea of ecosystem services is kind of an attempt to force things into the economic model. I would actually say this idea of ecosystem services, that ecosystems create this flux of benefits. And when we transform, we take the chop down trees and create this, uh, this desk or this, it's a physical transformation. When those same forests provide, stabilize our climate, filter our water, provide us with these benefits, they're not physically transformed. They're still intact at the end of the day. And these benefits are provided for all of us. So markets are based on competition. We compete for access. But these ecosystem services, we don't compete for a stable climate. We have to cooperate to generate one together. These ecosystem services, we can't force into a market model. They're separate from the market. They have to be, we need separate economic institutions to create those. So um, you know, we need cooperation. And this comes to the second part of the paradigm shift, I would say, this powerful lever. The current belief is that humans are inherent 
inherently selfish. We only care about ourselves. John Maynard Keynes said, capitalism is the astonishing belief that the wickedest of men will do the wickedest of things for the greatest good of all. <laughs> and the fact is, when the wickedest of men do the wickedest of things, we destroy our ecosystems. We destroy our economy. We have horrible results. And uh, so we have to change that notion of human behavior. And it's interesting that if you looked at, um, you know, 30 years ago, the uh, evolutionary biologists were basically saying, well, if somebody um, wasn't selfish, if humans weren't perfectly selfish, and I actually sacrificed my well-being for other people in my community, that reduced my fitness and enhanced the fitness of selfish people, and that altruism, that cooperative capacity, would be eliminated from the, the, the species. But now there's real advances showing that those groups who had the most cooperating individuals actually outcompeted the other groups with fewer cooperating individuals. So we have a real evolutionary mechanism for the evolution of cooperation. It is true that within the group, the selfish individual might outcompete cooperative individuals within the group, but too many selfish individuals, you lose your group. The point is, though, there's two evolutionary forces at work here. One that favors cooperation, one that favors competition, both capacities are inherent to the humans, and we have to recognize that. It would be foolish to try to design an economy based on cooperation if we're purely selfish, but that's not the case. So in terms of changing the paradigm, it's understanding what's biophysically possible, and it's understanding how humans behave. The second leverage point, she said, the second place to intervene, is changing the goals. What is socially, psychologically, and ethically desirable for our society? And again, the goals of our economic system currently are in the in this kind of the static condition. Our goal, what the market does, is it allocates scarce resources towards the producers who are able to pay the most for them. And it allocates the products among the citizens who are able to pay the most for them. And economists tell us that this assigns resources to the highest possible value they can generate. So we maximize value on the production side and on the consumption side. But what they neglect to tell you is we maximize monetary value. This is economies work on the basis of the economic demand is preferences weighted by purchasing power. And to give you an example of what this means as a goal, as an ethical goal, I like the case of I use in my classes this uh, drug of Flornithin. So it was a drug developed by Aventis that um, turns out it kills trypanosome, which caused African sleeping sickness, which uh, you know, potentially affects 70 million Africans. And the, the existing cure was horrendously painful and not very effective and often killed people. So they developed this aflornithin. And then, you know, the, so doctors who worked with poor people were very excited. We had this wonderful drug at our disposal. But Aventus looked at the market. So the demand, very high. Or, you know, the preference is very high. People want this drug weighted by purchasing power. These people have no purchasing power. So they said, we're not going to produce this for them. There's no, there's no profit in it for us. And doctors with abortion coach them about it. said, well, license it to us. And uh, they just said, no. And it turns out they said, no, because this same drug also gets rid of unwanted facial hair in women. And so they've already licensed it, the Gillette and Bristol Myers Squibbs, because you take the preference and weight it by the purchasing power. So to maximize monetary value, we want to allocate our scientists and laboratories producing cosmetics. And once you produce the drugs, you want to ration it out for the people willing to pay the most, which is the wealthy. And so that's what most people would say, well, that's not maximizing value. So an economist, the goal of economists is to maximize monetary value in the short run. Over the long run, it's this never-ending economic growth, which is impossible. And I would actually point out that in 1969, per capita consumption in the United States was a bit less than half of what it is today is measured by GNP. People rated themselves having a higher quality of life. They were more satisfied with life in surveys and happier than they are today. Poverty rates have gone up. Unemployment has gone up. So we've doubled the size of the economy, and we're not better off. So pursuing this goal of never ending economic growth is impossible and pointless. So instead, we've got to shift the goal. We need a new goal. This goal is to get shared prosperity for all of us. We have enough wealth. We have unique, in our history, we have the resources available to really solve our problems. We have the technologies to spread messages. We have the brains, the science. We have the capacity to solve these problems. But if our goal is wrong, we're not going to solve the right problems. So the shared prosperity is a goal. Now what we need is ecological sustainability, a shared prosperity for this and future generations. We need to protect our ecosystem. We also need a just distribution of resources. So is um, 
Uh, so very interesting, there was a study done by epidemiologists in England called uh, the book titled Spirit Level, and what they showed is an incredibly strong correlation between inequality and social ills and health problems. So the more unequal your nation, the worse off you are in terms of homicide, obesity, teen pregnancy, a whole array of lack of trust between individuals. So this, this goal of a just distribution makes everybody's life better off, including the wealthy. Um, so the, if you take these goals, right now we define a recession is two consecutive quarters with no economic growth. And we need, if you, if you change our goals, we totally redefine what a recession is. A recession is now defined as increasing inequality or misery, poverty, unemployment, or degradation of our ecosystem, which will lead to the misery and unemployment and poverty in the future. Once we redefine the goals, then we're going to totally reorient our effort to solve the problem. So last year, John Paulson made $4.9 billion. And, uh, we, so if your only goal is maximizing GNP, that is equivalent to 100,000 school teachers making $49,000 a year. We're indifferent between the two. But we shift their goals, suddenly hiring the school teachers takes on a lot more precedence. So, so once we've shifted the goals, her third, uh, uh, Donato Meadows' third lever, she said, well, it's not necessarily the third most powerful, but another extremely powerful lever is changing the institutions. And I don't have time to go on, go into depth about changing the institutions, but I do want to talk about a couple. Institutions or rules. One is our monetary system. People brought up this idea about a monetary system. Richard Heinberg pointed out that banks loan money into existence, and they charge interest on it. That's where virtually all the money in our economy comes from. But banks loan into existence a certain amount of money to firms. Firms, the banks want to make interest on that, so you got to pay back the loan plus interest. The firms want to make profit, and they, you know, they hire people who buy their goods and services, but the, the households want to have savings. And the problem is banks loan into existence a certain amount of money, and you've got to pay back that amount of money plus profits, plus savings, plus interest, and it's impossible unless your economy is continually growing. And if our economy stops continually growing, then what happens is we get these economic crises that lead to misery, poverty, unemployment. But for continue economic, continuous economic growth is biophysically impossible. So with the current monetary system, we're forced to choose between ecological collapse or economic misery and poverty. And uh, you know it's an unpalatable choice. So we need to change around that. I don't have time to go into what a new monetary system should look like. But I would like to say that what Harold Perovitz said this morning about kind of a public utility version of banking and money creation, where it's done for the public good in a not-for-profit mode. It's essentially, you know, we cover the costs of doing it and provide these resources for everybody. There's a huge list of reasons why um, this would be a better approach. But I also want to talk about our fiscal policy. So monetary policy is how the money system works. Fiscal policy is how governments collect and spend their resources. And taxes, if you look at this debate, you know, taxes are just considered a necessary evil. We have taxation to raise money because we need to invest in some things. But taxes are actually an amazingly powerful tool to achieve our goals. So if we want ecological sustainability, well, what you do is you tax resource extraction and waste emissions. If we want equity, if we want, if we, we tax um, unearned income. So what you do, unearned, the classic example of unearned income is I'm a land speculator. I buy a piece of land, I kick the farmer off, and so reduce the actual production, but I sit on it for a few years. It goes up 20% in value every year. I sell it for twice what I paid for it. I've decreased, actually, economic output, but doubled my returns. That's known as rent in economic terms, unearned economic income. That should be taxed 100% away. Um, we should also focus on we should also focus on our taxation system. Redistribution is incredibly important, and we talk about the injustice of charging these high taxes on the rich. What I like to point out is we shouldn't talk about what's the tax rate. We should talk about what's the residual. How much are those people left with after the fact? So returning to Paulson, not to pick on him, but um, uh, made 4.9 billion dollars. Actually, that was two years ago. But um, and, and Sun Elio, I think in, uh, in Mexico, made 20 something billion dollars. But the question is, would it be enough to leave Paulson with a million dollars a week? Would it, be, would it be like too cruel to tax away all but a million dollars a week? If we did that, that would be a 90, uh, 
leaving him with a million dollars a week would imply a 99% flat tax on every dime he earns. He'd still have a million dollars a week. His current tax bracket is 15%. So what we could do if we upped it to 99% is we could hire 84,000 school teachers at $49,000 a year and have a better society as a result. So, you know, Dana Meadows really put forward these leverage points to intervene and change the system. I would argue the Occupy Wall Street movement is really starting to redefine what are the goals for our society. All these ecological crises are starting to make people challenge, you know, what is biophysically possible. We're also now starting to tackle what do we want our institutions to look like. And this is a final comment. One of my least favorite economists, actually, is uh, Milton Friedman. And he said uh, that the only thing that brings true change is crisis. And we've got to be prepared with the ideas ready and the new ideas about what our monetary system should look like, what our fiscal policy should look like, how we should deal with the environment. We have to be ready with those ideas when that crisis comes. And so they've got to turn to us because we've got them. And this, I mean, that fortunate or unfortunate, I believe we have a lot more crises in the pipeline in the near future. And we've got to be ready with that roadmap for a new economy um, out there.